Thanks to all of you for being here this evening and at this conference. Can you all hear me all right? In just a few short weeks, more than 20 million college students will begin a new academic year. And to help pay for college tuition, many of them will rely on loans from the federal government, adding to one and a half trillion dollars of student debt that's already owed in the US. Most of them won't be free of this debt until they're well into their 40s. And meanwhile, the colleges they attend will spend a collective 27 billion on complying with federal regulations that touch on everything from how a credit hour is defined to how they need to organize their athletic organizations. Now, it might be easy for many of us to forget, or certainly for people in my generation, to not even be aware that it wasn't always this way. That actually, for most of our nation's history, the most significant fact about the federal government's policy toward higher education was that it really had no clearly defined policy. So how did we get to where we are today? What changed? And to answer that, we need to look back at Lyndon B. Johnson's Higher Education Act of 1965, the HEA. Now, in just a few minutes, Rochelle Peterson is going to tell you about the PROSPER Act, which is the House Republican-backed reauthorization bill of the HEA. So I want to use my time today to tell you a little bit more about the HEA in context. And we'll focus on three things. First, I want to talk to you about what federal legislation on higher ed looked like prior to the HEA. And we'll talk a little bit about the Great Society vision of higher education, a vision that we're still, in many ways, living out today, and which is... Uh, we are increasingly skeptical about whether it applies to the current situation. And then lastly, we'll actually look at the HEA, and I'll give you a little bit of a crash course on what was included in the HEA when it was passed in November of 1965. And I hope that all of you will get a new appreciation, maybe, of just how fundamental a shift uh, the HEA brought about in the federal government's relationship with colleges and universities and really laid the foundations of much of the government overreach we see on campus today. Prior to 1965, federal legislation on higher ed, first of all, there wasn't much of it. And second of all, it could all be characterized as indirect support. And what I mean by that is that the effects on higher education were always incidental to some other goal that the legislation had. And we don't have time to go through each one of these examples, but if you look at the GI Bill, for instance, in 1944, it provided funding for returning servicemen and women to attend college for a year or more. But the real goal of the, the legislation was to stimulate the economy, to reduce unemployment. It also included home buyer loans. So it wasn't geared towards supporting higher education as such. It is not until 1965, when the HEA is passed, that we see the federal government committing to direct support for higher education as such. So this is important. This is a, a paradigm shift that we see in the great society. Let's talk about what, was, what vision was behind that shift. 1964, President Lyndon B. Johnson gives a landmark speech at the University of Michigan where he lays out his vision for the Great Society, a society that will not only be materially prosperous, but also free from social ills, free from racism, free from inequality. And he said the Great Society would begin in three places, in our cities, our countryside, and our classrooms. So from the beginning, education was a vital part of what Johnson called his war on poverty. There's a growing sense in the 1960s that college ought to become a birthright for most Americans in the same way that high school had become a birthright, more or less, for most Americans in the 1920s. Um, that there's a sense that the prosperity America's enjoying in the 50s and 60s is due to, at least partially, uh, widespread access to education, better education across the nation, so why not extend uh, great, or create greater access to higher education as well? America will be even more prosperous in the years to come. And I think for, for President Johnson, there's also an element here where he thinks this is also the pathway to a more enlightened society. He was very bullish about the power of big government to fix all of our social ills. And we see that reflected in the HEA. That's why in November of 1964, President Johnson introduces a bill to strengthen the educational resources of our colleges and universities and to provide financial assistance to students in post-secondary and higher education. That was the original goal of the HEA. It was at the top of the bill. It's still at the top of the HEA, nine reauthorizations later. What I want to do now is give you a rundown of what was included in that law when it was passed in November 1965. 
Title I focused on authorized funding for community service programs for continuing education. Think night school, adult education, those kinds of programs. Title II created direct federal grants for university libraries. Pretty straightforward. Title III created grants for historically black colleges, community colleges, technical schools, more institutional aid. Title IV is the real heart and core of the HEA. When we think of financial assistance today, students filling out the FAFSA, colleges making sure they're accredited so they have access to all kinds of forms of institutional aid, all of that is rooted in Title IV. Student loans, Title IV. And so we'll talk about that more closely in a moment. Title V created a national teacher corps, created graduate fellowships for teachers, special grants for those who wanted to teach high school, teach elementary school. Title VI was, was titled Undergraduate Instruction. The original purpose was basically to give colleges and universities grants for technological upgrades. Now in subsequent reauthor reauthorizations, it's been repurposed and today it actually focuses on providing funding for studies uh, that are devoted, or centers that are devoted to international studies. And lastly, Title VII in the original law created uh, funding, institutional grants again, uh, for the construction of higher ed facilities. In 1964, one third of the population was under the age of 19. We're in the middle of the baby boom. There's real anxiety about whether institutions will have the necessary resources to meet the needs of the rising generation. And this was in response to that. But let's take a closer look at Title IV. The first part of Title IV created funding for educational opportunity grants. Now the rationale behind the grants is that these would be most beneficial to the lowest income students because you don't have to pay grants back, right? The assumption is that you'll graduate from college, get a decent job, contribute to the GDP, and that's how you're gonna pay society back, pay the taxpayer back. Um, in 1972, when the HEA was reauthorized under President Carter, uh, these grants became the Pell Grants that we know today. At the same time, they were also expanded and now many middle-class students take advantage of grants and use them to attend expensive institutions that they might otherwise uh, not attend if they had to pay out of pocket and just rely on student loans. So uh, there are questions now about whether the grants are even fulfilling their original purpose. Title IV also funded TRIO programs, college readiness programs, that is uh, career counseling for disadvantaged youth, maybe students whose parents had not gone to college and couldn't offer them advice. The next major part of Title IV are, is the low interest government backed loans that it created, the programs that it created. Now, the rationale behind these is that it would complement the grant forms of financial aid by meeting the needs of the middle class, right? There's an expectation that they can take out a loan. It's reasonable to expect that they will get a, a high enough paying job after college that they'll be able to pay back this student loan, they won't be saddled in debt. President Johnson himself uh, took out private loans in order to push, put himself through school. Uh, and then the last part of Title IV focused on work study programs. At the time, it was a comparatively small part of the financial aid programs created, and it still is. When you look at most, most financial aid is given out in the forms of direct grants, Pell Grants, and low interest loans. Now, I am running out of time, and I want to talk about two more important developments that came out of the HEA that we're still, we're still dealing with the fallout from this today. First, one of the things that the HEA stole from the National Defense Education Act, which was passed just a few years earlier under President Eisenhower, is the idea of making accreditation a gateway to federal funds. Right, so in order to receive Title IV funds, in order to get the kinds of institutional aid that HEA created, college needed to be accredited by a nationally recognized accrediting agency. Now, of course, who recognizes a nationally recognized accrediting agency? And the answer is ultimately the federal government, the Department of Education. So in, over the years, this has proved to be a kind of ingenious way of giving the government a lot of power over what goes on in classrooms, or as we saw in, under the last administration, what goes on in bathrooms and dorm rooms, for that matter. But all of that begins with the accreditation system set up in the HEA. And then in 1972, when the HEA was reauthorized, we got Title IX. Originally, it was pretty straightforward. 
message to universities was, hey, don't discriminate on the basis of sex or you'll lose your Title IV funding, for funding and other forms of institutional aid. Again, over the course of subsequent authorizations in the 53 years since then, we've seen new interpretations of Title IX emerge. Under the last administration, the Dear Colleague letters were justified by Title IX, uh, and in short, they have been weaponized uh, by opponents of academic freedom. Uh, what started as a, a simple non-discrimination clause uh, has been used to basically attack uh, as a bludgeon against uh, religious colleges, against people that don't tow the line that the Department of Education mandates they tow. So let's talk about what's the legacy of Johnson's Higher Education Act 53 years down the road. Well, when it was passed in 1965, the act was 52 pages long. It included seven titles, but laws have a way of creating new laws. Regulations uh, have a way of cancerously reproducing themselves. And today, or in 2008, when the HA was last fully reauthorized, reauthorized, the law was 432 pages long and had 11 titles to it. Right, on the one hand, more Americans are attending college than at any other point in history. One third of the adult population has a college degree now, but at what cost? Right, thanks to federal subsidies, college tuition has more than doubled in the last 30 years in real terms outpacing inflation by 2 to 4%, depending on what year you look at. When you look at a student loan debt, we now have six low interest loan programs. We have nine repayment plans, eight loan forgiveness programs, and 32 deferment options that we have $1.5 trillion of student debt. 11% of graduates are defaulting on their student loans, and that number is rapidly rising. And even as politicians like Bernie Sanders talk about the push for college that is tuition free, we look around us and see that campus seems to be less intellectually and academically free than ever before, which is no surprise considering that the HEA from the very beginning did little to nothing to spell out the actual purposes of higher education to create an educated citizenry. Um, now I think I've used up enough time riling you up against the Higher Education Act and now I'm going to <laughs> pass the mic to Rochelle Peterson and she will tell you why we should go back to the source what we can do to reform it, and why we should be hopeful now that lawmakers are considering the PROSPER Act. Thank you very much.